Can you talk about when you first reached out to the mental health sector for support? What led you to do this and how was your experience with mental health professionals? It was in marriage. Okay. Marriage is what started me on the path to uh, some sort of recovery. Uh, and I say marriage, it was to my wife a little bit, maybe when we first got married, but it was mostly once we started bringing children in. Yeah. And when we started bringing children in, I started realizing, man, I am way off course. And if my children really saw what was in me, mm -hmm. uh, I, I would really start maybe to feel like some shame. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and so in that, I sought a professional help uh, through uh, first psychiatrists. Then I found a psychologist who ref uh, uh, recommended me to a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I first sought professional help, I walked out of the offices of probably four or five psychiatrists okay. um, because for various reasons, but all mm -hmm. of them failed to live up to what I thought was um, a, a reasonable. Yeah. You know, one of them was like, "Well, I want you to read a book called Seasons in a Man's Life." I was having affairs, yeah. you know, and so I'm having this right because yeah. you have to sneak. It's mm -hmm. inauthentic. Yeah. You have the church. That's the worst thing you can do, except yeah. marry. So I got this going on, and and so. I go to them with this angst because mm. I'm starting to hurt myself more. Yeah. I'm, I'm drinking to, to hide my pain. Yeah. And uh, he's like trying to justify it. Read Seasons to a Man's Life. What Seasons we, to a Man's Life? I don't know. It's some book because oh, okay. he said, it's it will show you that we go through these phases as men. Okay. And I'm like, fuck you, you idiot. Yeah, We don't go through phases as men to, to have relations with extra women mm. hiding. Yeah. Don't lie to me. And I so it was that kind of psychiatry that was like, you're just as bad as the Mormons mm. who are saying you can never yeah. be this way. What is going to fix me, you idiot? Mm. When I found the psychiatrist psychologist mm. she opened me up to some things that helped yeah were you ever prescribed medication for yeah. your problems uh and it was like a decision i remember where i was uh fairview in uh orange county holding the the prozac yeah and it was like the red blue the red pill or the green blue pill yeah. in the matrix yeah. i was like this is going to alter my world. Do okay. I do it? Yeah. And and that was 30 years ago. Okay. Yeah. And I took it. And did it alter your world? It altered my world in that I would only have one or two fights a month instead of uh, eight or okay. 10. It altered my world and I didn't, uh, I calmed down with my family. Yeah. Uh, but it didn't alter my predilection for women uh -huh. or for manipulating others. Okay, but were you prescribed the Prozac specifically to reduce your violence? Anxiety. Anxiety. That was the word they used. Okay. It wasn't depression. Okay. Uh, it wasn't for to, to treat sociopathy. It was anxiety. And they sensed that I had anxiety because of the self-harm. Okay. But did they expect it to reduce the violence when they prescribed it? I don't know. I okay. think they did. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It would calm me down. And my, my response to an anxious situation, like somebody in traffic, mm. would be abated, yeah. so I would respond better. Okay. So, you were given this diagnosis of sociopathy formally in the 1990s. Yeah. At that time, how much did that diagnosis help you understand yourself? Not much even then. Okay. It, it, but it did, what it did was it was a second witness. My mom said it mm. decade earlier or whatever. Yeah. Then I hear it from a professional and I start to think, hmm, what, it, what is this about? Yeah. And then I really started to see myself as having no empathy for anybody. Mm. and being selfish my just as a jump ahead my yeah. wife went to see the same psychologist i was seeing okay. and she was saying he's so kind mm. he's so loving and she she said he's the most selfish person you've ever met yeah so she's been so supportive but the psychiatrist and psychologist had to point out no this yeah. guy is a manipulator and it brought mm. it to her attention okay yeah. In 1997, you had a roadside experience which changed you for the rest of your life. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, leading up to the day in August of 97, I had had affairs. I'd been abusing um, oxycodone, oxycotton. I had been drinking secretly uh, to where I'd get so drunk I'd pass out and so no one would know I was drunk. And my work was the job I was doing. I w was suffering. I was on the stake high council at the time. Yeah. Uh, I would self harm. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, 
it was just a dead end and i was what uh, intellectually i was what i call myself a nihilist okay. i didn't believe really in anything and i yeah. and i was really really down and uh and and so people could say well that's why you re had this roadside experience and i would say you're right mm. uh so my wife asked me to go pick up our daughters from a gymnastics practice in a neighboring town yeah. and as i drove to that i turned on the radio and i didn't listen to christian radio mm. uh at all and it was on a station uh charles stanley was the preacher and he yeah. asked a question over the radio to the audience he said if you could get yourself right why haven't you done it? Yeah. And when he asked that question, it hit me so hard because I did the mission, I married mm -hmm. the temple. I tried to be obedient. Yeah. You know, I was playing the role, the facade, mm. but nothing worked. Yeah. Nothing. I tried drugs. Mm. I tried alcohol. I tried affairs. Mm. I tried intellectualism. I read every book you can imagine yeah. and nothing was coming through. And so I listened to him and he answered the question, Matt, and he said, yeah. the reason you haven't done it is because you can't. Yeah. And I'd never heard that in my life. All I is all I had heard is that you can do it. Yeah. Pull yourself up. You're the man. You know, mm. play that play that Mormon thing, you know? Yeah. And when he said you can't, I continued to listen and he said, That's why Jesus came. Mm. And he came to do what you cannot do. Yeah. I had never understood that okay. with all the mission, teaching, seminary, everything. Mm. So I listened and he said take your life ask god to receive you and he asked me if i wanted to take this this challenge and offer the sinner's prayer so cars are whizzing by on this highway and my kids are going to get out of gymnastics and i decide i'm going to do the sinner's prayer and so i ask heavenly father that's how we pray as a as a latter-day saint heavenly father i'm a sinful man and i can't get over myself no matter what I've tried, I can't do it. Heavenly Father, will you forgive me for my sins through Jesus Christ? Jesus, will you come into my heart? Jesus, will you take over my life? Jesus, will you guide me from this point forward? I will do anything, Jesus. I will do anything if you will do this. And I'll wait for you to do it. I promise you I'll wait. Now, I have to admit, I hoped that when I had opened my eyes and said amen, that a miraculous thing would occur and, and the heavens would open and light would shine upon me and I'd be a completely new guy, but I wasn't. Nothing happened. Nothing changed. And uh, so I thought another failed attempt at finding something. Yeah. And I drove to the gymnastics practice. And as I waited for my daughters, my mind reflected on events of my life. And when I opened my eyes and they had come out of that gym, mm. I had radically, yeah. radically changed in my mind and heart because I realized spiritually, metaphysically, mm. people who deny it, it's okay, you can deny it. Yeah. I knew that I couldn't do it and that Jesus did it for me and that he really did accomplish for me, for me personally, yeah what I couldn't do. And when I had that, yeah. I was released from the burden of all my fears, all my actions. Mm. Maybe this was the great escape. Maybe this was the ultimate drug. I admit that's possible, but yeah. it served what I needed. Mm. And I was boom, changed inwardly yeah. at that moment. I was born again, a new creature in Christ. I was given a new heart. I was given a new perspective. I was given new power to change the things in my life. You've spoken previously about this roadside experience and how it reminded you of three memories. Yeah. Can you talk about those three yeah. individual memories? While I waited for my daughters, I went like this just now because I was laying back in my car. They're mm -hmm. inside the gymnasium in Costa Mesa. Yeah. And uh, I'm thinking, and the first thing I came to was I was about nine years old. I was in the shower. My mom was at the store. Nobody was home with my siblings. Yeah. The phone rang. I got out. I had a towel. I answered it. There was a man on the other end. He had a speech impediment of some sort. Yeah. I thought he might be, uh, he won't say retarded anymore. What would he say? 
Disabled. Disabled. Yeah. I thought he might. Well, we said retarded back then. Okay. And I thought he might have been retarded. Yeah. And he said, uh, you know, I want to talk to you about uh, Jesus. You know, yeah. Jesus. I'm like listening to him. I'm like, yeah, I know Jesus. Mm. And he said, can I pray for you? I said, sure. Yeah. And that guy started praying. And it was like he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Mm. And I was so embarrassed. One, I was naked. Yeah. But I had a towel around me. Mm. But I was on the phone. I didn't know what to do with this man. Yeah. I felt like it would be rude. So yeah. my bravery wasn't there that I established. That was later yeah I just listened to him he hung up i heard my mom come into the kitchen with mm. groceries i could remember the bags yeah. i went into my room and that memory came back okay second memory was i got off my mormon mission mary and i moved to logan uh utah or actually richmond utah to live in her parents one of her parents houses and uh i was working at a gym there and i came out on the pool deck and there was a guy with a mullet mm. and he was the only one out there and i was cleaning the pool that was my job and he was reading a black book and i said uh, you mormon and he said i used to be and okay. uh, when he said i used to be i said um, oh you know that was fighting words for a return missionary in his mm. arrogance and his narcissism so we started going back and forth. I'm telling him, you couldn't live up to the commandments. You couldn't okay. be obedient. Yeah. He's throwing stuff back at me that I didn't even listen to. And But he got up to leave and he, he said, someday you're going to know him. Mm. And uh, uh, that came back to my memory at the time. Yeah. The irony of that, Matt, was that my wife and I and my in-laws were traveling through Logan at the time. Yeah. And uh, we went into a McDonald's and mullet man was working behind the counter. Yeah. And I said to my wife, see what happens when you leave the church. Yeah. You become a counter man at McDonald's. Uh, he was a little bit older. Yeah. Uh, that was my attitude. That's okay. what the LDS church put in me on how yeah. to see others who yeah. worked behind the counter at McDonald's. Okay. Who had left the church especially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the third, uh, by the way, I was going through the airport when I was doing the television show here yeah. and from the back, you know, those guys who sit in the chairs and they don't let you enter yeah. as you're exiting at the airport mm -hmm. from the back. I saw him. I said, I know that's him. Okay. I passed him. I said, have you ever lived in, in, uh, Logan? Yeah. 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 I said, let me tell you what yeah, I told him. He said, I don't, I don't remember. I didn't mm. remember. And he was, he was working in TSA at the airport and mm. humble guy. Mm. You know, sitting there, probably had his Bible in his car. Yeah. Uh, the third memory was mm. I had worked at a, a bank as an investment officer. And the, there was a girl there who was a Christian. They knew I was Mormon. Um, and she uh, was leaving to get married. And she left a letter on my desk. It didn't attack Mormonism at all. It just said, I want you to know how important Jesus is to me in my life. Mm. And I took that letter and that uh, weekend, I shared it with what's called a temple prep class okay. in the Mormon church. And it was full of kids. And I read that letter and I thought they would be touched by it. Yeah. No, they used it as a, a cause for um, attack and ridicule and mockery. Okay. And these were just teenagers. And yeah. I was just kind of stunned by the response. I didn't say anything to them then. That memory came back. Mm -hmm. Then I opened my eyes, watched my daughters. Yeah. And that's when... Uh, I had that change within me that is was otherworldly. Okay. Yeah. Came home, told my wife. She's like, "Yeah, like, like, uh, you know, French mm. literature and like existentialism yeah. and like this and drugs and oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah." Poor lady had been through hell, mm. right? But I knew it was real. Okay. So that's what changed me at that day. Yeah. Uh, at that moment of a of putting an operating system in my heart and mind that I could use. Yeah. Yeah. Selfless, sacrificial love is what I've learned through my belief system, which I wasn't able to garner from any substance, any philosophy, or any religion. That's why I stick to it. Now, I'm not saying you can't be selfless and full of sacrificial love. Anyone who's a parent knows what that's about. And I ready, I'm, I'm with that. But I just, that's the thing I would be looking for. It's do, can you love selflessly? And I, I am not able to love selflessly. I put myself ahead of everybody without that influence. That's, that's my I message. See. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fascinating to me. Okay. As you're describing selfless love, the, the, the synonym that came to my mind, yeah. and I don't know if this is the case, was empathy. Sure. Are you, uh, is that the case? Sure. Is, did that event that happened that moved you into the stage three or currently where you're at, mm -hmm. did that event help you 
develop empathy oh, for my, other people? My God, it's unfolded empathy in my life. I, I never could relate to anybody's troubles or pain. I did not have any empathy before. Mm. And I've become empathetic toward the plight of everybody, any problem. That's what he's done for me in my life. That's what I think he's done for me in my life. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's that's so interesting because I'm now I'm thinking there are people who don't have the ability to empathize with others. Yeah. yeah. Right. Anti antisocial personality disorder. Yeah. That's me, like, brother. There are people that can't they can't put themselves in another person's shoes. Yeah. But it's my understanding that that's a brain that's an attribute of your brain, and it's not something that you can suddenly start doing. I don't think can can people who don't have empathy learn to have empathy? And here's where I would step in and say, I'm sorry, but through Jesus, yeah. Jesus changed my life from being a full-blown narcissist to being someone who, can, who now actually has empathy. And I can tell you that's true. Part of these religious beliefs often come with a penalty if you don't believe it. Yeah. And you didn't even mention this at all. No. But I'm wondering if one of your motivations for staying with it is the concern of being tortured for None eternity whatsoever. or anything like that? No, I don't no? believe in that. I believe God is love. He loves all people, whether they believe or not. He is complete love okay. and he loves them without or with belief. So it has no okay. fear in me. So there's no fear motivation no. that's also driving this desire to become more empathetic or something. It's gratitude. Like that. It's gratitude. It's gratitude? Yeah. There's a gratitude in me for the change I had at that roadside experience that said, you are such a, a selfish jerk. Start looking around, buddy. Wake up. And that's so I started to wake up. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell us about the time leading up to the roadside experience? Were there any particular events that could have caused the roadside? Well, um, I would have to say there was 36 years of events. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was stockpiling events. Okay. And I didn't know, uh, I didn't have a way to release those events. Psychiatry and psychology and Prozac nothing was releasing those events and setting me free from them. Mm -hmm. And so I was still operating by them. And so all of those things led up. Now they escalated and increased in their ferocity as I approached that day in yeah. The, yeah. So by the time I got there, it was like the snowball had reached the bottom of the valley. Yeah. I was in the middle of it and that was it. I was cold, dead mm -hmm. to the world. And I, the way I say it is I could have driven off. There was a bridge you crossed to get to the gymnasium. Yeah. I could have driven off that as well as gone to get them. Yeah. It, I was that low. Okay. So all of it contributed to the state of mind that I was in, which was low, broken, mm -hmm. and really finally seeking. Yeah. Before that, I I think I was trying to feed my mind as yeah. a way to get better and stronger or religion to get better or stronger or drugs or whatever, or women, yeah. but none of those things worked. This mm. worked. Okay. Did you ever, or have you ever lost your belief in God, in a creator? Not in a creator, Okay. Uh, but I did think that he was an, in, he, she, it, mm. whatever, was an indifferent bastard, uh, an absentee manager, and that there was nothing that was important between it, she, him, and me. Yeah. But I did not let go of the idea that there was a supreme being. And for some reason, I've always believed that, mm. right or wrong. Uh, and, and that is what has been something that's been central to my life. Yeah. You said before that at the roadside, you had a thought, you're such a selfish drug, wake up. You are such a, a selfish jerk. Start looking around, buddy. Wake up. That's a feeling of guilt. How could you feel guilt without feeling empathy at the time? I think it was just, I think it was just uh, intellectual. You know, okay. I had the facts of what a selfish prick looked like. Yeah. I think having children helped bring something out in me, maybe in combination with the Prozac mm -hmm. and the counseling. Yeah. I think those things help open my eyes to the fact of what unconditional love looked like because yeah. I unconditionally love those kids yeah i didn't unconditionally love my wife that was very conditional but i unconditionally love those kids yeah. and i think that really helped me get to the point where i was then ready and broken to hear what i heard okay can you tell us about your transformation following the roadside experience how did it change you and over what period of time i'm really glad you asked that question because of where I am now, but mm. 
This is a misnomer among the world of Christianity. And that is when you become or receive God through Christ in your heart, mm. you become perfect. Yeah. That's a lie. Yeah. It's a categorical lie. In fact, you still remain a really pathetic human being. Yeah. But I knew in me that he was there. Yeah. Because I knew he was there, I didn't think there was anything else for me to do or be. Yeah. And so I continued to be an ass. Yeah. And yet I was a Christian ass. Mm. And I had affairs. A born again Christian ass. I was ass. a born again Christian ass. Yeah. And because I didn't I wasn't equipped with anything but the knowledge mm. that there was someone who cared about me unconditionally. Yeah. And because he cared about me unconditionally, I was of the mindset, well, I can do whatever I want. Yeah. Right? So he'll love me no matter what I do. <laughs> and that was kind of yeah given to me by some people later in the faith that he loves you unconditionally. And I really mm -hmm. believe that and knew that within me. So I didn't have a, any sort of ability to resist my natural inclinations. However, yeah. Yeah. I did feel, start to feel bad. Yeah. And so when I would do something, I would think, I know he, they say he loves me mm -hmm. unconditionally, but so if that's the case, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. And that grew over probably four years okay. uh, where I was still lost. I didn't know. I was still LDS. Yeah. I was a born again Mormon. We wrote a mm -hmm. book called that. Yeah. And, uh, but I still had my flesh, but inwardly I knew. And that's a distinction I think that's so important because you're not going to find saviors as Christians. You're going to find usually people who are pretty... Uh, messed up mm, yeah people who need it who need it yeah and and i admit there are people who uh ostensibly don't need it mm. uh i think they will realize that they did need it to some extent once their narcissism falls mm. by the wayside yeah. but the people who really need it and this is what jesus taught that's why those who have much sin will love him the most yeah because he took and that's what it was for me mm. yeah okay um in t 2009 2010 you took the hair test for psychopathy. Yeah. Why did you decide to take it? How did you take it? And what score did you get? Yeah. Uh, by that time, I had been doing a television show for four, four to five years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd been in the public and I was like a local celebrity. Mm -hmm. And um, I started to think, you know, I'm getting attention. What am I really? And I just learned online about the hair a yeah. test for psychopathy yeah. so i can't remember how many questions i think then it was about 30. Yeah. and it and you had a score online and so i took it as if i was sean mccraney without having that roadside experience your former self former self yeah. okay. and i scored if I, i'm just making this up mm. like a 28 out of 30. yeah in terms of being a confirmed psychopath mm. but then when i looked at those results and i compared it to what i had become yeah it was night and day. I, I was scoring maybe like a six or seven. Okay. And so I knew that I had found something that worked for me. Mm. And I actually tried to contact uh, them. Yeah. I sent them a letter or an email and said, hey, I have a solution that works with mm. us. I scored this. That yeah. used to be me, but I got nothing back. Okay. Yeah. Well, if the people running the hair study are watching this, yeah. <laughs> Sean's reaching out to you again. Yes, let's so. talk. <laughs> <coughs> You'll be receiving a letter in the post. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Did you find it particularly difficult to develop empathy? Yeah. Following the roadside. Yeah, because, oh man, that is such a good question. Another thing I would like to make clear from my estimation, and that's after decades of studying the scripture, mm -hmm. um, I have to choose empathy every day. Okay. My lack of empathy has not left me. I still in Sean McCraney, born in Whittier, California, mm. am a fucker. And I like to say it that way be, yeah. without any hesitation, because given the right circumstance and given my inability to choose to do what I know I'm supposed to do, I will fuck you up. Yeah. And, and, and I don't do that much anymore. Mm. And I choose empathy much more now than I ever did, but yeah. it is a constant daily choice. And it's a conscious choice. It's every a conscious day. choice. Mm. I am faced with a situation and mm. I know 
much more strongly now the way yeah. that Jesus would do it. You know, yeah. what would Jesus yeah. do? I hate that, but that's true. <laughs> you know, what yeah. would he do? And so like Martin Luther said, be Jesus to your neighbor. Mm. So every time I'm confronted with something, I have to choose to be Jesus mm. to my neighbor out of love for him, for what he did for me. Yeah. And when I do that, that tool, and I mean that as a, a tool, yeah. I used to think, Matt, that when you became a Christian or you were a good Mormon, yeah. that God overwhelmed you and you became a puppet yeah. and you didn't even have to think, uh -uh, mm. no way. Yeah. And so what happens is those who really are grateful for what he's done, mm. choose daily to mm. die to themselves and to love like he tells them to. Yeah. That is mis That is not understood. Mm. And so people who act like something else I would question that thing. So mm. daily I am sure. Uh, we had a recent um, engagement with a woman who was ill, who needed a ride. Yeah. My initial thing was screw okay. you, screw you. Yeah. Yeah. Immediately. Yeah. And then I said, no, no not screw you, Sean. Yeah. You're not the guy who gets to choose this. And so I like within seconds now. Yeah. I, and so that's how it has developed. And so, it has developed and it's stronger and it's better and it's more present with me. Mm. But if I give it a few days, weeks, months yeah. of inattention, okay. the gnarly guy comes back. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just for the audience, the lady who was ill was on the Greyhound bus with me. So this just happened two days ago. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. And okay. I had never met Matt. Yeah. And he in came person, out from the yeah. Greyhound bus, which right there, Greyhound bus in my world's <laughs> like, what? <laughs> and it's one in the, it's two in the morning. Yeah. He comes up, Sean, there's a woman who needs a ride. And I'm like, who are you? You jackass. I'm up at two in the morning. This is all milliseconds. Yeah. And then I'm like, this is homeless central milliseconds. Yeah. And then she comes around the corner and she's black milliseconds. Sorry. This is the reality. All of this is happening. Yeah. And then at the same time, I have God in my world, in my mind saying, Sean, mm. shut up. Yeah. Just shut your ugly, fat, grotesque mouth yeah. and love the way you claim you're supposed to. Yeah. With that operating system in me, I said, Matt, what mm. do you need? And you say, we need to take her to the shelter. So we did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That didn't show at all. So. No. And in the past, <laughs> yeah. and what religion does is it mm. makes you see the person doesn't want to do it, but they'll do it. Okay. Yeah. You know, we'll do it, Matt. Yeah. You know, and that's the called religion. Yeah. I have learned to let him bring it through so that there is no inauthentic, an inauthentic expression. Mm. It's real from my heart in honor of my God. Yeah. And that is what I think matters. Okay. How much has religious scripture helped you to understand the nature of good and evil? Can we go above a hundred percent? Yeah. Yeah. A thousand, 10,000 yeah. percent. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a final thing I'd like to make relative mm. to the faith. These expressions of roadside experience, I'm changed. Jesus loves me. I don't need to change. Yeah. That's bullshit. The scripture, ancient scripture shows you have to learn what God expects of you. Yeah. If you want to uh, follow that, yeah. unless you learn it and you never know it, you're mm. going to continue to do what the flesh does. Yeah. Yeah. So it's invaluable that people learn what that says yeah. in kindness and love yeah. being fulfilled, by the way, it's done. It's all over. This mm. is what has happened. And so therefore learn what God really wants from you. And we know what he wants from us by the illustrations of Jesus, his yeah. life. What did he do? Mm. So that's when you learn what he did, you embrace that yeah. and it's vital to growing. I have had countless people mm. over the past two decades who have had the Jesus experience, roadside experience. They went to a concert, mm. they were emotionally charged and were saved yeah. and they go off and a year later you see them, you know, being an ass as usual. Yeah. It's from a lack of learning what God wants you to know. Okay. What situations now do you find it most difficult to show empathy towards other people? Uh, I'm excellent in Christ, I say, but I've mm. always been okay in showing empathy to uh, the people who need real help. Okay. So, if, like for example, uh, someone who's um, uh, psychotic, okay. schizophrenic. Yeah. I can spend all day with them okay. because I have a heart for them because they are truly, you know. Mm. 
Uh, but as you move, that's the polarization. Yeah. That's the in one end. Mm. But as you start to move into homelessness, I start to have to resist judging them okay. for being there. Yeah. It's their fault. Okay. What they do, I forget cause and effect. Uh -huh. And then as you move up the line, mm. I become very, very resistant to people who are entitled. Yeah. And the, the, and this might be part of my sickness, but mm. people who walk about arrogantly yeah. and feel entitled mm. and have that attitude, yeah. I, I have to resist them mm. to chop down a few notches. That's okay. my problem. Is that because they remind you of your former self? I think, it, yeah, yeah, quite possibly. Yeah. And it reminds me of the facade of religion yeah. and, and of corporate America mm. and that we hold up our CEOs as something mm. or even like our rock stars and actors. I used yeah. to really be a uh, hold all of them up. And now uh, when they start to feel entitled and they're living lives of luxury, yeah. you know, I don't like corporate authorities who present them or religious who present mm. themselves as superior. Yeah. Who, what I do is I look at them compared to Jesus. Yeah. And I say, he had no place to rest his head. He mm. was probably like the most homeless person we've ever met. Mm. He was not attractive. He had nothing to offer. Yeah. That I can relate to. Mm. But because of him, I have to treat those people at the higher echelon with okay. love. And that is what I've learned. That's my biggest struggle, mm. to have empathy for them. So do you find it easier to empathize with victims of harm or the victimizers of harm? Always with the victimizers. It's easier to. Easier to, okay. yeah. Because the victims, I often feel like they were uh, stupid and they deserved okay. what they got. Uh -huh. The victimizers, because I was one, mm. I relate to them better and I have more understanding. So if a person, we read that a man, um, he imprisons somebody or he kills somebody, I have a heart for that man and I want yeah. to go to the prison and reach him. Yeah. Uh, the person who is dead, I see in a scope of eternality uh -huh. and I feel like God loves them. They're okay. Yeah. The family who's remaining. Okay. I feel a little bad for, I get it. Yeah. But my empathy is really more naturally toward the criminal. Okay. Now, having grown a conscience, how do you feel when you look back and remember the people who you hurt? What do you <coughs> feel now that you couldn't feel then? Oh, um, uh, I understand who was hurting them, but I still am responsible for the pain I've caused. Uh, I don't think I can escape that. And so I have a, 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 a heart for the pain I've caused deeply, going all the way back to the girls I was uh, messing with in first grade. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, so what I do, Matt, is sometimes I will think about the people I've hurt and I'll pray, you know, please bless them and help them and for, forgive that. And, and there's a principle within the faith of yeah. helping God make all things aright. And so my contribution to them, because they're long gone and I don't even remember names sometimes or what I did, mm -hmm. but when they come to my memory, I will pray that God will bless them and help them and erase the damage that I've done. If yeah. it does anything, I don't know. Okay. But that's the best I can do yeah. in addition to trying to live better now. Yeah. Did you ever try to reach out to any of your victims to apologize? Yeah, I've reached yeah. out to many people uh, over the years and done that. And um, I reached out to a woman years ago, a few years ago, mm. uh, who I engaged with in ninth grade. She came from a, a bad home and I took full advantage of her yeah. and I reached out to her and called her and she said, you know, my life was pretty messed up for quite a while after you, Yeah. Uh, but I'm better now and I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. Okay. And so it, that I did, her name was Karen mm. uh, and uh, I don't know really if it really did anything, that yeah. physical reaching out. Did and, anything for you or for them? For, I, I don't know if it did anything really for either of it because I think uh -huh. that that healing really is spiritual. Yeah. So the mechanics of actually doing that, I don't know. Maybe it helps, but I, I, I the only way I could reach out was that. Yeah. I felt particularly bad about her. Yeah. I felt particularly bad about a few others that I have really put through the ringer over the years. Yeah. yeah. Do you think it's fair to hold, your responsible, hold yourself responsible for your past actions? given that you d you couldn't care, you weren't capable of caring or feeling. I, I, I was incapable of feeling, 
but I, um, looking back, I feel like I knew yeah. I was hurting them. Okay. But I didn't feel it. I just knew it. You mean intellectually? Yeah. You knew. yeah. Intellectually, I knew. Uh -huh. I think I really fucked them up is the way I would put it. Mine. Yeah. But I didn't feel it. Mm. Right? You didn't care. Didn't care. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's kind of a strange dichotomy there of mm. am I responsible or am I not? Yeah. Cause and effect. Yeah. You know, how much did all the things in my upbringing do? Yeah. But where I do feel ultimately very responsible mm. is for how I treat people uh, now uh -huh. and in the future. Okay. Um, and that I have an imposing responsibility yeah. to try to do it right. Okay. Yeah. What's your greatest regret in life? Boy, that's a good question, man. Mm. I have so many regrets, Matt. If I look back on them, um, I think my greatest regret was deceiving my wife into marriage, not her without her knowing who I really was, okay. and then um, playing the role bringing in children into this world, mm. giving her hope that I was somebody I wasn't mm. and manipulating her. And then, and then I would have to collectively throw any single woman I've ever had an extramarital, uh, um, alliance with mm. that. Those are my regrets. Yeah. The reason is, is my children know about those. Yeah. And I think that has done more damage to the to those children yeah. than anything else. Yeah. And because girls have a real need for dad to be a good man mm. and I wasn't. Yeah. And they held me up as a good man because I was a good dad. Okay. And then when that house of cards was revealed, mm. I think it destroyed them in their hearts in a way that can't be. It's hard to fix that man. Yeah. Um, I know God is, is there to help. Uh, really hard to fix that when you've done that kind of damage and i know that again it's selfish because it's my children mm. if i really allow myself and think about it i've done that to other people's children yeah i've ruined their their hearts yeah you know and i've caused many people to go off into very bad ways of life uh initially and i know it's not just me and i know it's cause and effect but those are my greatest regrets. Um, look now, looking back at the harm I've done and the ripple effect that it has uh, in the world. And I really can't calculate how bad that has been, yeah. even though I've never been put in, well, I've been put in jail, but yeah. never went to jail for anything like that. But uh, my heart breaks for the pain I've caused in other people's lives. My heart doesn't break for the pain I've caused God or Jesus on the cross yeah. because they unconditionally loved me and did what they did because they wanted to. Yeah. But these people were preyed upon, even down to my children, my wife. Mm -hmm. And you can't take that those ripples back. Yeah. You can't do it. Yeah. And that is brutal. And it keeps me in a place that I need to stay. And that is humble and okay. broken. And I don't have the right to flip somebody off in the car. Yeah. And I don't have the right to challenge authority. I don't have the right to do these things to people. That's not me. And that's, so I feel bad when I've done it. I'm yeah. sorry, I'm so emotional, but no. that, re that really stri strikes a chord with me. That mm. was a great question. Okay. I'm gonna take a break? No, okay. no breaks. Okay. Authentic. Authentic. <laughs> <laughs> to what extent do you think you should take ownership and credit for your transformation? None. Zero? Zero Why? credit. Why? Uh, it's like, how can a pig take credit for being a pig? <laughs> 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 and, then, and then deciding because they have been equipped with a... And a, a way to live life yeah. to put on a tie. Well, isn't it more like a pig becoming a human? Yeah, or, well, put yeah. on a tie. That, okay. that's the, how, how can <laughs> a pig feel proud about being given yeah. the tools to stand up on its 
hind legs and walk about, put on a tie and become a citizen. Yeah. I did. I'm a pig. Yeah. Right. And so I have nothing. I tell people mm. there's nothing in me. And it's really important to me in this discussion to yeah. know. And I've tried to make this apparent throughout our ministry. Mm. Don't look at me. I am a jerk. And if you think I'm something and you mm. want to thank me, you have no idea what I could do to you or your family if you crossed me mm. and I didn't have Jesus. And by the way, this mm. is irony, is that when people who mock faith yeah. and do that in an acerbic way, yeah. in my mind, I'm saying you have no idea how Jesus is protecting you right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And I know that's kind of a crazy, psychotic way of thinking, mm. but it's true. Yeah. yeah. He has brought light instead of darkness yeah but it was a struggle to change oh and it's a daily struggle so sh can you not take credit for that struggle for the effort that you put in the only thing i can say is i have chosen to allow yeah okay so a drug addict to crack mm. who chooses to allow narconon or whatever it is to help them yeah that's the only credit they can take okay that's it they have allowed mm. and that's the only thing i'll say i've allowed why mm. i don't know Okay. Yeah, but I've allowed it. Yeah.